ALF J6. The booster's impact was detected by the seismometers left on the moon by Apollo 12 and Apollo 14, providing useful scientific data. There was a malfunctioning light on the craft service propulsion system. After considerable troubleshooting, the astronauts did a test burn of the system that also served as a mid-course correction. Fearing that the light meant the SPS might unexpectedly fire, the astronauts avoided using the control bank with the faulty light, bringing it online only for major burns, and controlling it manually. After the mission returned, the malfunction proved to be caused by a tiny bit of wire trapped within the switch. ALFJ7, ALFJ8, after purging and renewing the LM's atmosphere to eliminate any contamination, the astronauts entered the LM about 34 hours into the mission, needing to check the condition of its equipment and move in items that would be required on the moon. Much of this work was televised back to Earth, the camera operated by Worden. The crew discovered a broken outer cover on the range, range rate tape meter. This was a concern not only because an important piece of equipment, providing information on distance and rate of approach, might not work properly, but because bits of the glass cover were floating around Falcon's interior. The tape meter was supposed to be in a helium atmosphere, ALFJ9, but due to the breakage, it was in the LM's oxygen atmosphere. Testing on the ground verified the tape meter would still work properly, and the crew removed most of the glass using a vacuum cleaner and adhesive tape. ALFJ9, as yet, there had been only minor problems, but at about 61 hours 15 minutes and 0 seconds mission time, Scott discovered a leak in the water system while preparing to chlorinate the water supply. The crew could not tell where it was coming from, and the issue had the potential to become serious. The experts in Houston found a solution, which was successfully implemented by the crew. The water was mopped up with towels, which were then put out to dry in the tunnel between the command module and lunar module Scott stated it looked like someone's laundry. ALFJ-10, at 073, 31-14 into the mission, a second mid-course correction, with less than a second of burn, was made. Although there were four opportunities to make mid-course corrections following TLI, only two were needed. Apollo 15 approached the moon on July 29, and the lunar orbit insertion burn had to be made using the SPS, on the far side of the moon, out of radio contact with Earth. If no burn occurred, Apollo 15 would emerge from the lunar shadow and come back in radio contact faster than expected, the continued lack of communication allowed mission control to conclude that the burn had taken place. When contact resumed, Scott did not immediately give the particulars of the burn, but spoke admiringly of the beauty of the moon, causing Alan Shepard, the Apollo 14 commander, who was awaiting a television interview, to grumble, to hell with that shit, give us details of the burn. ALFJ-11, the 398.36 second burn took place at 078, 31 to 46. 7 into the mission at an altitude of 86.7 nautical miles above the moon, and placed Apollo 15 in an elliptical lunar orbit of 170.1 by 57.7 nautical miles. On Apollo 11 and 12, the lunar module decoupled from the CSM and descended to a much lower orbit from which the lunar landing attempt commenced. To save fuel in an increasingly heavy lander, beginning with Apollo 14, the SPS in the service module made that burn, known as descent orbit insertion, with the lunar module still attached to the CSM. The initial orbit Apollo 15 was in had its apocynthian, or high point, over the landing site at Hadley. A burn at the opposite point in the orbit was performed, with the result that Hadley would now be under the craft's parasynthian, or low point. Overnight between July 29 and 30, as the crew rested, it became apparent to mission control that mass concentrations in the moon were making Apollo 15's orbit increasingly elliptical parasynthian was 7.6 nautical miles by the time the crew was awakened on July 30th. This, an uncertainty as to the exact altitude of the landing site, made it desirable that the orbit be modified, or trimmed. 70, lasting 30.40 seconds, and raised the parasynthian to 8.8 .8 nautical miles and the apocynthian to 60.2 nautical miles. As well as preparing the lunar module for its descent, the crew continued observations of the moon and provided television footage of the surface. Scott and Irwin entered the lunar module in preparation for the landing attempt. ALFJ-13, after analyzing the problem, the crew and Houston decided the probe instrumentation umbilical was likely loose or disconnected. Worden went into the tunnel connecting the command and lunar modules and determined this was so, seating it more firmly. With the problem resolved, Falcon separated from Endeavour at 139 to 16. 2, about 25 minutes late, at an altitude of 5.8 nautical miles.
Project 98 to send Endeavour to an orbit of 65.2 nautical miles by 54.8 nautical miles in preparation for his scientific work. Aboard Falcon, Scott and Irwin prepared for powered descent initiation, the burn that was to place them on the lunar surface, and, after Mission Control gave them permission, ALSJ-7, they initiated PDI at 104 to 30, 09. 4 at an altitude of 5.8 nautical miles, slightly higher than planned. During the first part of the descent, Falcon was aligned so the astronauts were on their backs and thus could not see the lunar surface below them, but after the craft made a pitchover maneuver, they were upright and could see the surface in front of them. Scott, who as commander performed the landing, was confronted with a landscape that did not at first seem to resemble what he had seen during simulations. Part of this was due to an error in the landing path of some 3,000 feet, of which Capcom Ed Mitchell informed the crew prior to pitchover, part because the craters Scott had relied on in the simulator were difficult to make out under lunar conditions, and he initially could not see Hadley Rill. He concluded that they were likely to overshoot the planned landing site, and, once he could see the rill, started maneuvering the vehicle to move the computer's landing target back towards the planned spot, and looked for a relatively smooth place to land. ALS J7, below about 60 feet, Scott could see nothing of the surface because of the quantities of lunar dust being displaced by Falcon's exhaust. Falcon had a larger engine bell than previous LMs, in part to accommodate a heavier load, and the importance of shutting down the engine at initial contact rather than risk, blowback. The exhaust reflecting off the lunar surface and going back into the engine had been impressed on the astronauts by mission planners. Thus, when Irwin called, contact, indicating that one of the probes on the landing leg extensions had touched the surface, Scott immediately shut off the engine, letting the lander fall the remaining distance to the surface. 5 feet per second, Falcon dropped from a height of 1.6 feet. Scott's speed resulted in what was likely the hardest lunar landing of any of the crewed missions, at about 6.8 feet per second, causing a startled Irwin to yell, BAM! Scott had landed Falcon on the rim of a small crater he could not see, and the lander settled back at an angle of 6.9 degrees and to the left of 8.6 degrees. ALS J7. Irwin described it in his autobiography as the hardest landing he had ever been in, and he feared that the craft would keep tipping over, forcing an immediate abort. 3. With approximately 103 seconds of fuel remaining, about 1,800 feet from the planned landing site. Scott reported, OK, Houston. The Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. B. ALS J7. Once within the planned landing zone, the increased mobility provided by the lunar roving vehicle made unnecessary any further maneuvering. With Falcon due to remain on the lunar surface for almost three days, Scott deemed it important to maintain the circadian rhythm they were used to, and as they had landed in the late afternoon, Houston time, the two astronauts were to sleep before going onto the surface. The time schedule allowed Scott to open the lander's top hatch and spend a half hour looking at their surroundings, describing them, and taking photographs. ALS J7, ALS J9, Dickie Slayton and other managers were initially opposed due to the oxygen that would be lost, but Scott got his way. During the only stand-up extravehicular activity ever performed through the LM's top hatch on the lunar surface, Scott was able to make plans for the following day's EVA. He offered Irwin a chance to look out as well, but this would have required rearranging the umbilicals connecting Irwin to Falcon's life support system, and he declined. After repressurizing the spacecraft, Scott and Irwin removed their spacesuits for sleep, becoming the first astronauts to doff their suits while on the moon. 106 aboard the lunar roving vehicle throughout the sleep period mission control in Houston monitored a slow but steady oxygen loss. Scott and Irwin eventually were awakened an hour early, and the source of the problem was found to be an open valve on the urine transfer device.